University of Pennsylvania in the Urban Design Department. He's a big shot in land preservation in Lancaster County, and many of us are uh, interested in that. And uh, Tom has written, I think, what we would call the handbook in the uh, business, the Environmental Planning Handbook, and uh, has a brand new book this year, The Law of Agricultural Land Preservation in the United States. Tom has been kind enough to talk about land value taxation in his uh, master's classes at, at Penn for some years, and he's been even kinder in bringing me in to help out at times. And so I'm very grateful for that opportunity, and he is also, I think, one of the newest, if not the newest, members of the board of the Robert Schaffenbach Foundation. So I would uh, like everybody to give a great uh, welcome to Tom Daniels. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I want to uh, also thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me and for having the conference here in Baltimore. This is a city I, I really enjoy visiting, and uh, it's always nice to come back here. And I hope you have learned that uh, there is no tea in Baltimore. No tea. There's no tea. Okay. Uh, I have to make one uh, correction, actually, on this, this list here of names with uh, email addresses. Uh, my, my email address is missing uh, the letter H. I, I go Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, not Tomas, T-O-M-A-S. So uh, if you ever, ever want to get a hold of me, remember you got to put the H in there. Uh, so uh, I guess one of the reasons why um, I was asked to be on the board of the Schockenbach Foundation is I've actually published a couple of articles in the, uh, the flagship journal, uh, the American Journal of Economics and Sociology, and I'll, I'll get to mention some of that in my presentation here. Um, I want to say that uh, it's unfortunate my co-presenter, Sharon Suarez, could not be here today. Her mother passed away this spring, and Sharon has been really um, swamped with trying to uh, settle her mother's estate, so she sends her regrets. Um, so you're just going to get me uh, this afternoon. Um, following up on Rick's excellent presentation, uh, I'm going to give you my own take on, on land value capture. Somebody suggested to me earlier this afternoon that we call it land value recapture. Um, so whichever the way you want to capture the value, that's, that's fine with me. So I want to talk about some of the tools and techniques. Uh, Rick has, has introduced some of these to you already. And I want to talk more specifically about how some of these tools and techniques might be used here in Baltimore, which is a, a, a really um, important laboratory, as you'll see, because here in, in Maryland, uh, you have a program called Smart Growth. And this was legislated back in 1997, and it really elevated the state of Maryland uh, on the national stage as far as managing uh, growth in an intelligent way to have economic growth, population growth, and yet maintaining a quality environment. And we'll see how land value taxation can, can play in, uh, in that overall effort. I don't mind if you ask questions as I present. I want to leave a good amount of time at the end for other questions. But if you have a burning question while I'm still uh, up here uh, with my PowerPoints, please feel free to, uh, to interrupt me. Uh, Raise your hand and wait for the mic, though. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so uh, if land value capture is going to be a go-to tool for city planners, I have to explain to you what planners are. And I've been training planners now for about 25 years. I actually worked uh, in local government for nine years. I do a lot of consulting work in planning as well. So here's my take on what planning is or planners are. Uh, this is the most important slide that I show my students, and uh, I did give the first lecture in my land use class this morning, and of, of course they enjoyed this slide uh, immensely, because now they know if I disappear in a puff of black smoke, the reason why is because God hates planters. The, the, well, uh, when, often when I put up this slide, I'm asked that these are my daughters. And the, the answer is no. Uh, I actually have three sons, 
two of whom are taller than I am, and I have to look up that, at them, which, of course, is a very humbling experience. Uh, but, but the young lady on the left, I think, has a, an important message as well. If you've read as many zoning ordinances as I have, you know that sin and shame are a whole lot more exciting. So, uh, so I won't be heavy on the, uh, on the zoning for you today. But, um, of course, when we talk about uh, city planners and we talk about land value taxation, we have to recognize that back in Henry George's day, there were no such thing as city planners. And so how can city planners uh, make use of, of land value taxation in the work that they're doing? And city planners generally focus on, first of all, doing a comprehensive plan, a blueprint for how the city should grow and change over the next 20 years or so, and then coming up with regulations such as zoning, subdivision, and land development regulations about where development should go, at what density, what uses, and what infrastructure developers should provide versus what infrastructure government should provide. And as you know, um, planners don't have the, the final say in the decisions about development in a city. This is up to the elected officials, the politicians, the city councils, the mayors, or if you go out to a, a county, it's the county uh, commissioners or, or county supervisors who make those elected, who make those legally binding decisions. So one of, the, one of the real disconnects we have in the whole planning process is we have good technical planning now, very good technical planning, in part because now we have GIS, which has really enabled us to, to access a whole lot more information about cities and counties. And on the other hand, we still have you know, that technical information and, and recommendations funneled through the political process, which of course, as you know, is, uh, I'll just say semi-corrupt. It's not fully corrupt, it's just, it's just semi-corrupt. And um, so how do we work around that? And I, and I really appreciate the, the story Rick had to tell about Potomac Yards. I'm going to share that with my class because I think that's a, an excellent example of how the political process can get in the way of, of good planning. So local tax policy certainly can drive development decisions. Um, I have to confess that I do live in a suburb. I have lived in the city of Lancaster. I lived there for nine years. I paid their school taxes and property taxes. And now I live out in the suburbs where I pay, relatively speaking, lower property taxes uh, as a result. And the tax situation uh, is such that if you capitalize the property tax savings, I calculated this once. It's it's really worth you know tens of thousands of dollars over the life of a of a house in, in a settlement decision. So uh, somehow we've got to level the playing field between the suburbs and the cities because probably the biggest challenge we have right now in land use planning is how do we bring our cities back? And if we continue to expand further and further out, it's going to continue to tear us apart uh, socially. It's going to be environmentally damaging because now more greenhouse gases are coming from transportation than they are from electrical generation. And that's because of our very spread out uh, settlement patterns and dependence on automobiles. So tax policy is very important here. Um, the traditional property tax really discourages investment in buildings uh, because if you improve your building, wham, your property taxes then go up. And so this has really discouraged a lot of people from, from making improvements in, in buildings. Um, and I want to mention also down here at the bottom, federal tax policy, on the other hand, encourages the depreciation of buildings. If, if any of you own rental property, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> you know, so investment in building is really, uh, is really discouraged in the process. Um, at the same time, we have a national crisis in affordable housing because since the, the crash in the real estate market in 2007, 2008, we have not been building enough housing each year. And this is going on, you know, 11, 12 years now where, we're, where we've been falling behind. And so everywhere in the United States, you find this affordable housing problem. So. Yes, I, I, I did. If you, if, that's that's the simple the, the simple 
um, equation of property value being uh, a matter of net returns to the property divided by a capitalization rate or an interest rate. And uh, if your property value uh, is going to uh, be taxed away, uh, it's going to continue to um, show up in, in, in lower uh, net returns. So um, what, we're, what we'll see, and, and I think Rick pointed this out very well, is if you can reduce, if, I mean, if you can put a tax on land, you're going to reduce the price of the land. Um, this, he, he's absolutely right in what he said about land values, and one of the ways I know this is my oldest son works in the San Francisco Bay Area doing low-income housing finance. And the biggest problem that he has is the, is the cost of land. It's not the cost of building, it's, it's the cost of land in, uh, in providing we knew that. affordable housing. <laughs> what? We knew that. You knew that, huh? Okay. That's good. Thank you. Um, so public infrastructure investment uh, can certainly increase the value of privately held land, creating an unearned increment. Uh, here in Maryland, uh, my family has had some uh, ex uh, experience with this. My brother, uh, who's a tax attorney and a very clever guy, uh, once upon a time bought a condo in Bethesda, Maryland. And then the metro came in. And then he cashed in, you know, and after, yeah, he never lived there. I mean, it was just a, an investment property. You know, it's a nice under an increment that he walked away with, thank you to the metro. So again, how do we capture some of this increase in, in the value of private property? And could this be a way to pay for public infrastructure, especially when federal uh, infrastructure funding is lacking? Where's the one trillion dollars of infrastructure spending that the Trump administration promised us? And you know, one thing to, to follow up on, on Rick's presentation, um, the federal government has recently been very stubborn about actually releasing money for mass transit as well, which of course is oversubscribed year after year, um, and we could we could go on about that. One of the problems that uh, my fellow planners have, it relates to the Baltimore UDAG study down here at the bottom, is a lot of planners are waiting for the next urban renewal program. They want urban renewal to come back. And I believe this too, it would be great if we had a national program to really bring our cities back. It would be wonderful socially, environmentally, and economically. And Baltimore is a great example of this because in the early 1980s, the federal government created this Urban Development Action Grants program, the UDAG program, and the people who wrote the program then left the federal government and they came here to Baltimore. And because they had set up the program, they knew how to write the grants. <laughs> and so they wrote the grants, and a lot of money came to Baltimore. And they got all this federal money, and then they partnered with James Rouse, who did Columbia, you know, Maryland, and other projects, and they did the Inner Harbor. The problem with the Inner Harbor is that it never really had the spread effects throughout the city. Uh, I've been to Camden Yards many times, and if you park five or six blocks away from Camden Yards, you're in some pretty rough neighborhoods. So, you know, it was it was a good thing. I think they got the UDAG money, but it was by no means uh, a complete solution for for Baltimore. So the the first rule about land value capture is do not just give away land value. And Rick had mentioned, you know, if you have upzoning of property, which is what, you know, every property owner wants, um, you know, what do you get in return? And they, they can say, oh, well, we'll build this and we'll provide jobs and we'll give you more, you know, property tax revenue after you give us these huge property tax breaks. Right. Anyway, um, don't just give away land value you, by upzoning or necessarily by putting in uh, infrastructure that also forces up uh, land value. Uh, Rick had, had listed a lot of these uh, land value capture tools. Uh, I'm going to add a few other ones that we can debate. Uh, one is transfer of development rights, uh, community benefit agreements, uh, public land leasing I'm going to skip over, uh, but inclusionary housing 
uh, and inclusionary zoning is, is, a, is a technique, for example, to provide or get developers to provide more uh, affordable housing. Uh, Rick talked about I impact fees. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about business improvement districts and in particular tax increment financing and then finally um, land value taxation and how they all compare. So the first example I want to show you here is uh, a, a transfer of development rights program that New York City has used in connection with their Highline um, project, which, which the Highline of course was a, a railroad um, in the southern part of the city and they then turned it into this wonderful linear park and one of my former colleagues uh, from Penn, uh, James Corner, his firm actually uh, did the design work on the High Line. So, so what they said is, well, we don't want all this, you know, high-rise development right around the High Line because then that, that blocks the view and it really detracts from the amenity of the High Line. So we want to enable property owners here to transfer what you would call air rights from this area out to this area. So you can build higher out in these areas and keep this open and a, and a nice public amenity. So I wouldn't necessarily call this land value capture. What you're actually doing is you're, you're simply moving the land value from one place to another, but the value you're getting for the public is maintaining that public amenity. And it has been an extremely popular public amenity uh, for New York City. So here's the high line in, in green running through here. So you have the higher, um, the taller development in other places. And so you, so you maintain that, that amenity. And here's a shot of, these are, these are German tourists, you can tell because they're so well dressed. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, enjoying their their time on the on the High Line. This is where I saw in French Connect. This is what I saw in French Connect. Uh, that, well, that's that. No, that's that's just the elevated. That's just the elevated. That's that's other places. But yeah, that's pretty pretty good chasing in that little. Yeah, pretty good. Uh, also from New York. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the example of community benefit agreements. Uh, this is um, in many ways outside of the realm of planning and it's these benefit agreements have been done between developers and community groups and it has been a way of actually getting some uh, value capture you know, out of the developers. So, you, so the agreement itself is negotiated, it's an enforceable contract. Um, and so the community pledges support for the development to say, you know, we're not going to oppose you and in front of the politicians, we're not going to take you to court, you know, and delay your project, these kinds of things. But we want some concessions about maybe on the size of the project, maybe the infrastructure that you're going to provide, labor hiring, you know, you're going to hire union labor versus non-union labor um, on the part of the developer. Uh, a community benefits agreement was used in the case of Atlantic Yards in, uh, in Brooklyn, uh, in New York. This is 22 acres and about $2.4 billion project, very big. And what they negotiated was, you know, some, some traffic improvements, some affordable housing, uh, some open space, and even some community centers. So, so they got, you know, they got these concessions out of the developer. Um, one of the things I caution you about with community benefit agreements is they really are useful only in the case of large developments. If somebody wants to build, you know, a you know, 25 unit apartment building, a community benefit agreement is kind of you know, overkill. But this is a this is a big development that, that affected a, a very large area. The second thing about community benefit agreements is probably so far fewer than 200 of them have been done nationwide. And part of the reason for that, I think, is that you know, many cities, if, if, the, if a developer is going to come in and do a project, many cities are so hungry for that development that they don't want to ask for anything. They just say, oh, yeah, we'll give you, you know, tax concessions. You come here and, you know, and everything will be great. Uh, I don't know uh, how many of you saw the onion uh, last fall there was uh, an article, a satiric article, of course, 
uh, about how Philadelphia was going to knock down 200 acres of Center City uh, to attract Amazon H2 to come to, to, come to Philadelphia. Uh, but that's, that's the kind of example uh, that, I'm, that I'm getting at there. But, but realistically, cities should not be afraid of asking for um, concessions. Um, if the developer's really serious, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll make those concessions. Inclusionary zoning. Um, this is not by any means a complete solution for low and moderate income housing. But it is, uh, it, it is a move in the right direction, and it is a way to capture uh, some um, value uh, from developers by requiring them to provide a certain percentage of units in a development for low and moderate income housing. New York City uh, currently has uh, a requirement on all new residential construction that at least 20% of those units be for low and uh, moderate income housing. And I will add that the, uh, the deputy uh, mayor, uh, Alicia Glenn, who uh, enforces this rule, uh, is a former uh, employee of Goldman Sachs, but she also taught housing policy for us at Penn for many years as well. Yes? Is that low-income housing to... Uh, subsidized or is it just a small enough unit that they can afford it it's it's a small enough unit that they can afford it okay uh, but and it's and it's subsidized by the people who built the market housing correct correct I mean and and so the the other thing is I'll show you in a moment uh, to sort of sweeten the the deal uh, for the developers you know can offer the developer a bonus in height if they're going to provide, you know, that that level of, of low and moderate income housing as well. Yeah, question. When I, was, uh, when I was doing housing financing in New York, uh, the maximum income for low, in, low income housing was 165% of area median income. Is that still about the same number that you're using yeah that's that sounds a little high to me um, usually uh, when you talk workforce housing uh, it's between 80 and 120 yeah, percent look we found no one could afford that I mean, <laughs> I mean no one could no one could afford any housing at 80 to 100 I don't know I, I worked for Fannie Mae so we, we had we were involved with programs in New York City and uh, and low-income housing was up to 165 percent of area median income. Uh, that's why I was curious well, what, that's a what was happening today. In terms. I I can only tell you what I know. <laughs> and, but that 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 sounds a little high. The, the the but let me let me share with you this story that my son told me about a project that he's doing in Oakland right now. He's telling me that these low and moderate income units that, that his, his company is, is you know, helping build in Oakland right now are costing about $800,000 to build. And again, that's, you know, that's the land cost, the land, you know, that is really driving that. It's, uh, so. California, Oakland. Oakland, California? Yes, that's correct. Oakland, California. Yeah. Um, are, are you through with the presentation part? No, I'm not even close. Okay. I'd like people to only ask questions if they didn't understand something, and we'll get to the discussion type questions at the end. Is that because I don't want I don't want the presentation to be cut off by fa falling into discussion. Good idea. Right? You mean I should quit while I'm ahead? <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> so. Here's, here's the, again the example from the High Line where uh, with inclusionary housing combining the, the transfer of development rights here uh, in the blue and, and also in, in, the, in the green. And then here's a, a bonus uh, that would also be a uh, height bonus if there's going to be uh, low and moderate income housing in the project as well. So there are ways to ways to do that to really incentivize on the one hand the developers and on the other hand if you're going to incentivize them you know get something back for it in, in, in low and moderate income housing but again 
whereas I think this is a step in the right direction, it's, it's not a complete solution by any means. We're, we're still just, we just have a shortage of, of low and moderate income housing, uh, especially for, for renters. Yeah. Uh, when you've got those real high rises so that people like Tom Brady can have a billion dollar suite, uh, what about the shadow effect? Uh, how, how is that taken <laughs> into account? Uh, um, they, they, like, uh, they like the canyon effect in New York City. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I really can't. Uh, illuminate uh, much more on than that, um, but it's a valid question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, impact fees, and again, uh, Rick touched on this, uh, newcomers benefit from the infrastructure that long-term residents or previous residents have paid for. Um, an impact fee is usually a per lot or per dwelling fee um, to help pay for new infrastructure needs caused by the new development. So if you have, you know, a 300 unit project come in, you're probably going to need, you know, more facilities for park and recreation space, for example. Um, but your impact fee has to be specific. It's a, is it going to be park and recreation fee? Is it a sewer impact fee? Is it a transportation impact fee? And each fee that you use is supposed to be held in a separate account to cover the future cost of that infrastructure. Um, Bill Batt knows a place called uh, the town of Bethlehem because he lives next door to it. And I used to live there for five years and we had an impact fee for park and recreation. And what was uh, revealed uh, to us voters uh, was that the uh, elected officials were squirreling the uh, impact fee into the general fund so they wouldn't have to raise taxes on us. So that was... Uh, <clears throat> No, nah, it was not proper uh, to do that. But certainly the case with impact fees is they do increase the, the cost of housing, um, which, is, uh, which is a problem. Very quickly, uh, business improvement districts or tax increment financing, this has been used extensively in the Midwest. And the idea is that there is an area where infrastructure is going to be provided by the city but because property owners in that area are going to benefit directly from that infrastructure, that their property taxes are going to increase for a period of 20 years to help uh, defray the cost of the bonds sold by the city to pay for the infrastructure. And at the end of 20 years, um, those incremental taxes then are added to the, the overall tax base. Uh, I saw this firsthand uh, many years ago when I lived in Manhattan, Kansas, which of course is known as the Little Apple. Um, and uh, I was teaching at Kansas State University in those days. And they, they took the, the Main Street and they said, okay, we're going to you know, repave Main Street, we're going to put in street furniture, new street lights, and we're going to you know, attract a mall at, 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 the, at the end of Main Street. And so uh, this, was, this took a long time to, to put together, but it was very successful. Um, the businesses on Main Street benefited. They didn't have to compete too much with the mall, but it really solidified Manhattan's position as a regional retail center. So it, it really was a, an, an overall, I think, win-win uh, type, type of a, a arrangement. So again, here we finally get to land value taxation, which as you know, the typical property taxes um, get half the, or half on land and half on buildings. Land value taxation puts more of the taxation on land than buildings. And Henry George, of course, wanted to tax land only, and uh, that never seems to have really taken hold too much in the United States. But the benefits of land value taxation, I think we all recognize that it can raise just as much revenue as a typical property tax. It certainly does create an incentive for urban property owners to use their land more intensively or sell it to somebody who will use it more intensively. And again, this is one of the real problems we have in the Rust Belt City. 
So moving on, land value taxation really creates an incentive, which is something economists love, of course, to redevelop vacant land and buildings. And it really breaks the hold of speculators who just sit on land waiting for the value to increase without making any improvements. And it really does promote compact and, and mixed-use development. By the way, I was explaining to my students this morning, um, you know, back way in the 1930s, um, and, and you probably know this having worked for Fannie Mae, the, 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 the FHA had a rule that said we will guarantee mortgages um, but only in, in mixed-use projects, but only up to 25% commercial. And in many cases, that wasn't enough to make a lot of these mixed-use projects work. In 2012, FHA finally got some of the message, and they increased that 25% to 35%. So it made it more attractive to do mixed-use projects in cities. What's very attractive from a lender's standpoint is if you can make a loan and then you know, sell that loan on the second mortgage market to, to a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, you, know, you get your money back and you start you know, recycling it through and you, you make you know, a lot more money that way. The benefit, obviously, for cities is that they get more mixed-use development and they get more projects and they, they redevelop uh, more. Um, so I'd like to see it be 50-50, but you know, I'm, I'm not in control. So land value taxation is going to capture some of the increase in, in land value from, from public infrastructure investment. It certainly could be combined with inclusionary zoning uh, to uh, promote more uh, affordable uh, housing. And here in Baltimore, more than half of the renters spend more than 30% of their income on rent. That's kind of the, the, the rule of what affordable housing is. If you're spending more than 30% of your uh, income on housing, then you're housing burdened. Um, some of you know these land value taxation examples. Josh uh, Vincent knows them very well because he, he explains them to my class every year. Uh, Harrisburg, which is, which is not my favorite place, but um, it is the capital of the, of the Commonwealth that I live in. Uh, adopted a, a split rate tax, uh, a land value tax, way back in 1975. And it has really led to a lot of redevelopment in, uh, in Harrisburg. Uh, as you can see, um, the number of vacant structures has, has gone down uh, enormously since 1982. Uh, Pittsburgh, and from 1980 to 1995, had a land value tax and uh, building activity was greater in Pittsburgh than any other city in that region, that Midwestern region, except for Columbus, Ohio, which of course is a is a capital city. Um, you you have to Columbus, ask. Columbus statistics are based on annexation. The, uh, that can be too. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, you'd have to ask Tom Murphy, who was the former mayor of Pittsburgh, who now works for the Urban Land Institute, um, and why he. Uh, um, uh, I won't say allowed land value taxation to, to disappear from Pittsburgh, but uh, why it did. Uh, so it would be a kind of an interesting thing if, you know, next year, are you going to be in Pittsburgh next year? Yeah. you got to get Tom Murphy to come there and, you know, grill him good, you know, to find <laughs> out. But I really think that the, what the land value taxation did for Pittsburgh is set up a momentum for Pittsburgh to really be one of the shining stars of urban redevelopment in this country. There are no steel mills left in Pittsburgh. There are no Pittsburgh Steelers. I love to tell Steelers fans that. Um, it's clean. Uh, it's, it's really a, a very attractive place. People who live there love it. Um, the, you know, the population has shrunk. It's stabilized like um, Baltimore has and Philadelphia has as well. But I think land value taxation really sent Pittsburgh on the right road. Um, I was going to do a little more about talking about Baltimore and Philadelphia because they have a lot in common. Uh, they both have large areas of abandoned lots and buildings. They have large areas of brownfields. Um, I have done the brownfields redevelopment tour of Baltimore. It's really impressive. Um, 
there is a need for more local tax base, obviously. Median household income in both cities is below the national average considerably. Both cities have poverty rates of over 25%, and neither city can expand physically. They are landlocked. Even though technically annexation is allowed in both states, uh, it simply isn't done. So, you know, the thinking is if, you know, if Baltimore could annex Ellicott City and if Philadelphia could annex Lower Marion, you know, that would greatly, uh, greatly expand their tax base and solve their problems. So one of the questions I want to, I guess I'm going to have to finish up with here is uh, why not just give property tax abatements? And this is something that Philadelphia has been doing for uh, several years now, probably about 15 years, something like that. And uh, there was a study done that showed that 10 neighborhoods concentrated around Center City here make up 59% of the property tax, you know, properties receiving this 10-year property tax abatement. So up here in the north um, east part, this is where a lot of brownfields are. Here in number eight and number nine, number eight in particular, um, this is West Philly. I come through West Philly every day on the train to go to work. Lots of brown fields there. Um, nine here. So it's basically University City where Penn and Drexel are in Center City that have really walked off with the, uh, the property tax uh, you know, benefits here. Uh, the, real, the real secret to the, to the success, I think, though, of Center City is in Philadelphia is that in 1998, you know how many sidewalk cafe seats there were? Zero. Zero. You know how many are there are today? 4,000. So it's become that much more pedestrian friendly, and, and you know millennials have been flocking to uh, to Center City uh, in recent years. So uh, I guess Eric is telling me I'm out of time. Uh, thanks again for inviting me here today. It's great to see my fellow board members of the Schockenbach Foundation, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions you might have. Thanks very much. Just have one question, Tom. Thank you very much for the presentation. What uh, 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 the low and moderate income housing? How do we uh, do that in a perpetuity fashion? How long does that that value remain low? It it really depends on how you you write the contract, and what you, what you can say is that. Um, you know, if there's an increase in the value of the property uh, and, and the low and moderate income, you know, owner then sells the property, that they only can capture, you know, a small percentage of, the, of that increase, of that capital gain. That's really, that's really one of the ways to do it. And how many flips does it take before the low income value is, is gone? <laughs> That's a good question, and, and again, it's going to depend on how you actually write the contract. Are you going to allow a 5% you know, gain? You, I mean, you could write it so that you even allow no capital gain, I suppose, and that way it wouldn't be a, a flip problem. But you know, writing those contracts is not simple. You know? and, and one of the reasons why um, You've had the nonprofit sector step in in a big way. We have now uh, many community land trusts around the country that are really geared towards trying to keep housing perpetually affordable, and they do that by actually, you know, buying properties and, um, you know, working with, you know, low and moderate income residents to to keep that housing affordable. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, okay, uh, you talk about the, how the government infrastructure spending increases the land value, but also the the landowners or the land the residents around there, they're they're also contributing because they're developing and renovating their buildings, so that increases the land value also, right? And a mm -hmm. good example would be a gentrification where there may be no government spending, but it's all these more affluent people moving in and. And they, in fact, they don't use even build new houses. They just renovate old houses. 
in the land value goes up. That's true. That that certainly can happen. Yes. And that's uh, you know that's actually building up the equity. But let, let me just add something that I think you'll find interesting. I have a friend who lives here in Baltimore. He works for the Annie E. Casey Foundation. He's also the chair of Smart Growth America. And uh, he also happens to be African American. And he came to Penn uh, at my invitation a couple years ago. And he was very upfront about saying, you know, some gentrification just isn't a bad thing if, if we're talking about bringing cities back. So. Uh, you know, you can you can look at what happened to you know landowners in a place like Park Slope in Brooklyn. Their values went up, and you know they were able to actually cash in on some of that. So it's it's there are some negative things about especially forcing out renters. You know that's that's a problem. Yeah, I guess I'm trying to understand the slide that we got up there. It looks like uh, uh, property owners are given tax abatements. So with that extra money, they developed uh, private uh, development, and that led to a success. Is that what the slide says? What, what they're trying to say there is that, especially you had a lot of um, uh, commercial and residential development in Center City. So the population in Center City, Philadelphia, has increased by, I don't know, six or 7,000 at least. In, in the last, you know, several years, and you know, we've had a lot of construction <coughs> in Center City as well, which, which eventually, when the the ten year abatement, you know, uh, lapses, will actually expand the property tax base. So it's kind of like a, a delayed effect, is what you're talking. Because I was trying to yes. understand the the George's principle here that we're not collecting the, the ground rent, but. You're saying after the period's over, that's when you collect it. Yes, yes. The 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 example that appeared in the Philadelphia Inquirer was uh, a surgeon at uh, Penn Hospital, uh, whose income I think is a little higher than mine. Uh, he he bought a, a 1.2 million dollar condo in Center City, and uh, was paying like 1,200 dollars a year in property taxes, which is a little less than I have to pay. So, you know, I'm wondering where's the equity here, <laughs> you know. But, um, you know, I think, it's, I think it's a desperate measure. I've, I've seen other cities, for example, York, Pennsylvania adopted this and has had almost no construction, you know, in the city itself other than the new ballpark. Okay. So. I think, thank you very much for your, oh, did you have another question, Marty? No, no, no. Okay. Tom, thank you very much for your presentation. Your statement that uh, traditional property tax discourages investment in buildings really jumped out at me. Um, we have a really serious problem in San Diego and California in general. Um, I've seen more homeless people in three minutes than I saw in three days in New York City. And my wife and I were walking around San Francisco and it was unbelievably abysmal. The, the homeless people we had to step over just to get from one part of town to the other. And uh, it, it's really a serious crisis in California. And I wonder if you could tell me how to get Californians to fall out of love with Prop 13. <laughs> um, in, uh, full, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, my brother lives in San Francisco, my middle son lives in San Francisco, and my oldest son lives in Marin County north of San Francisco, and I was just out there um, last month. Um, you're, you're right. I asked my brother about this, about the homeless, and he was telling me they are actually in San Francisco spending about thirty to $35,000 per homeless person in San Francisco. And, you know, if you, if you keep doing that year after year after year, you've got to figure out that you're better off you know, finding them some, you know, some more long-term shelter, um, and the, the the problem in San Francisco is um, exacerbated by the the earthquake risk. There, there's just no other way to put it. Um, so to go high, I know the Salesforce Tower, you know, yeah. was just built, but that's going to fall down. You know, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure. Um, 
but um, you know, the, the problem is that um, there needs to be a lot more multifamily housing there, um, and individual, um, you know, especially when you go down the peninsula towards Palo Alto. I mean, it's all very high end, and so. Um, there's there's a real you know issue that um, a fellow named Myron Orfield in uh, Minnesota, who you may know, um, has wrestled with for many years, about how do you get um, suburbs in particular to take their regional fair share of low and moderate income housing. And he was trying to actually legislate. He was a state senator as well. He was trying to actually legislate requirements for uh, regional fair share of affordable housing. So you wouldn't have these just, you know, wealthy enclave after wealthy enclave. But it's, 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 you, you really see it in San Francisco, especially if you walk along Market Street. Yeah. What are brown fields? Brown fields. Good question. Uh, a brown field is a site that has been contaminated. Uh, but it is uncertain how contaminated that site is and the level of cleanup that would be needed to bring that site back into development and what kind of development. For example, um, here in the, in the Inner Harbor, there, was, um, there, there are two projects I saw. One was uh, the DAP company, if you've ever used glazing on windows, you know, which I've done a lot of. Uh, they, their site was, was pretty seriously contaminated, so what they actually did is they, they dug up as much soil as they could, but they also put a concrete cap on it, and so it, it, it was, it's now being used, I think, as, as partly warehousing, because, they, you know, you're not going to have people living there, you know, 24-7, but so the level of exposure isn't, isn't as great. Whereas if, if you're going to have, you know, um, redevelop um, a brownfield for, say, a park, then the standard is what's known as the dirt in the mouth standard, because you might have little kids put dirt in their mouths. They do this, you know, they do this. So it, it, it's going to do, and you really don't know what the contamination level is until you've had, you know, a phase one and phase two environmental assessment. Is that Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, you have a lot of these sites. Uh, there, there are probably 400,000 of these sites around the United States, and you know, and most of them are in the old Rust Belt cities. They're not necessarily yeah. polluted, but they are necessarily um, need a lot of cleanup. Yes, and they're expensive to clean up too, which is which is a challenge. Hi, uh, I have a friend that's a planner in the municipality of San Juan, Puerto Rico, and uh, he's a he's a bit of a uh, leaning on the Marxist side, and he thinks that inclusionary zoning can regulate affording affordable housing into existence. And I would like to know your opinion on what are the unintended consequences, aka the dark side of inclusionary zoning. How do developers uh, how do developers Respond to to inclusionary zoning. Is it is it benign or does it have uh, an evil consequence? Huh. Uh, well, let me first say that I'm not a Marxist. So uh, anyway, uh, interestingly enough, uh, in the concept of inclusionary zoning was really pioneered here in Maryland, in Montgomery County, uh, and really quite successfully. The one of the ideas behind inclusionary zoning is that people who actually work in the community can also live in your community. So, you know, the postman, the teacher, the, you know, uh, the salesperson can, can live in the same community as, as the doctors, the lawyers, and, and uh, you know, and well, well off business people. So you actually have a better social mix. I think, I think the dark side is when inclusionary zoning can be kind of like a Trojan horse, as this gentleman was suggesting, is that, okay, yeah, we're going to start out, we're going to, it's going to be inclusionary to start, and then, you know, either after a certain period of time or after a certain number of sales have happened of the same unit, you know, the value of it, then 
leaves the low and moderate income level and, and effectively goes back to market rate. And um, so that's why I, we had a little discussion about how do you keep it you know, affordable over the long term. But I, but I think, you know, the, the, there, there were, you know, I, I think the good kind of outweighs the, the not so good at this point. And, and, and I'd, I'd like to see, you know, more social inclusion. One of, the, one of the real problems that we've had in our Rust Belt cities is that we've really concentrated the poverty. And inclusionary zoning is one of the ways to try to deconcentrate, you know, so. Uh, Tom, uh, one of my dream programs for perhaps next year's uh, Georgia's conference would be to have you come and have uh, Bill Fischel at, at Dartmouth, um, who I guess you might call a Georgist of sorts. I'm not sure. Uh, but he's got a very dim view of zoning, and he sees it as a form of rent-seeking. And I'm wondering, even now, without Bill being here, what your response might be to the idea of zoning as rent-seeking. I think it has been used as rent-seeking uh, by many uh, more upscale uh, suburbs. Uh, again, Myron Orfield uh, wrote a very interesting book called Metropolitics and, 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 and then American Metropolitics. And, and what he did in those books is really identify what he called the favored quarter. It's really one quarter of the suburbs that really walk off with the majority of the jobs in the tax base. And what those favored quarter communities tend to do is what's called fiscal zoning. They zone for large lots. You know, you have to have a minimum lot size of an acre to be able to build a house. Well, who can afford that except, you know, very well-to-do people? And the idea is that if you have, you know, a big house on a big lot, it's going to generate enough property taxes to cover the services that it demands. And the second thing you do is you zone a lot of land for commercial and industrial because those land uses generate more in property taxes than they demand in services. So that rent-seeking uh, type of zoning uh, is really aimed at, uh, you know, capturing the land base of the region and, you know, the other three quarters of the suburbs and the center city can go, you know, suffer. So, so you know, there's a valid point there. Maybe you ought to be opposite Orfield. No, I, I, I agree with a lot of what uh, Orfield has to say. The, the real challenge is how do, you, how do you break that cycle and get you know, that favored quarter of the suburbs to take their regional fair share of affordable housing instead of using really what legally is exclusionary zoning to try to keep those people out, you know, those people. Okay. One, one of those last books, he said something like Minneapolis has, now has nine rings of development going out, which is incredibly inefficient. And I don't know how you break that cycle either. They have a remarkable road network because they have I-90 and I-35 going in there and they have all kinds of you know connector roads they do have a light rail now finally from the airport from Lindbergh Airport up to the up to the city uh, itself which is a positive step but it's a very heavily auto dependent region it's the third most sprawled region in the United States yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I appreciated your presentation Is that on yeah. hello how about that? Can you hear me? Yeah. Get it up towards your mouth. Uh, you mentioned uh, that Montgomery County was a pioneer in inclusionary zoning. I lived there for many years, and for those of you who don't know, it's suburban outside of D.C. Uh, each year they have affordable housing conferences in which they give awards to people 
banks and builders who who build it inclusionary zoning and and legislators who provide money to build uh, so-called affordable housing and yet the end of these annual conferences and, and after all the awards they say we've got a housing crisis and please give more money and support these legislators and these builders so they can do more and there are huge waiting lists even though they've done inclusionary zoning and it, it gets the 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 distance between affordable and the average housing cost grows each year and they have conferences on all kinds of housing issues except the land value tax which might help solve some of their problems. Okay. Let's say that. Uh, are you, yeah, I, let, let, me, let me respond by saying uh, Montgomery County, if you compare Montgomery County to its neighbors uh, on the issue of affordable housing, they actually look pretty good. Um, I'm in sort of preliminary discussions about doing some work across the Potomac in Loudoun County, Virginia which is a very wealthy county, as you know, and yet uh, they don't seem to care at all about affordable housing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not an issue that, that they even address. Um, if you go north from Montgomery, you run into Howard County, uh, which also doesn't seem to have a whole lot of interest in uh, affordable housing. So, I, I, you know, Montgomery is one of, what, the top ten wealthiest counties, I think, in the United States. And yet they have provided um, literally thousands of, of units of affordable housing. Uh, it may not be enough, which is what you're suggesting, but um, you know at least it, it, it looks a lot better compared to its neighbors. Yeah. Um, one, one thing was that um, affordable rental housing tends to take on aspects of rent control and of housing projects over time. And affordable purchase housing, it's very much like you said, it tends to get flipped when the, minim what the, the period it has to stay affordable when that expires, it tends to get flipped. Um, I was told that in Ireland, because I, I I was all of the opinion that all density zoning is snob zoning. And somebody from Ireland corrected me and said that they have maximum lot size zoning. So that if you want to do a development, it has to have a certain density. And that is their way of making the development uh, more affordable. That's an interesting point because when we talk about zoning in the United States, we almost always talk about minimum lot sizes. You know, is it 5,000 square feet? At, you know, basically eight units to the acre. Is it 10,000 square feet? You know, the, the standard suburban four, you know, four units to the acre kind of thing. What is it? And you know, just just to give you a, a little bit of um, you know a benchmark here, the the thinking among planners, and this I think relates somewhat to Rick's uh, presentation, is that you need at least seven and a half units to the acre to make mass transit financially feasible. Um, the county I live in, Lancaster County, um, we have actually over 500,000 people. I know everybody thinks you know, Lancaster County, they all drive horses and buggy, yeah. <laughs> but we have over 500,000 people. And so the county planning department has really been trying to encourage our, our cities and our boroughs, uh, our villages, to build at a density of at least seven and a half units to the acre to be able to support uh, mass transit. And um, you know, this is this has got to be you know the standard that you know new development uh, adopts, not just in cities but especially in suburbs, so that we will have more uh, feasible uh, mass transit. I guess I have the next question. Uh, a couple comments about abatements and the economics of the abatement. I don't know if you'll agree, and then I ask a question about current statistics. Uh, we have five minutes for three more okay. questions. My experience, 
My experience with abatements is it makes the landowners even richer because people can borrow more and they have to carry a higher mortgage debt when they pay a larger price for the unit. Then when the 10-year abatement expires, the question is, has the people's income increased sufficiently to cover the increase in the annual property tax? The question is, do you have any data on defaults uh, on, mortgage, on either mortgage debt or property tax liens defaulting at the end of the abatement periods? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And the kind of um, development, residential development that we've been seeing in Center City, uh, much of it has been kind of the empty nester moving in from the suburbs, you know, I, you know, and, and people who work at in Philadelphia already, you know, at Drexel or Penn or, you know, so they they have the, you know, the, the income to be able to support the uh, or meet the uh, the bump up in uh, in property taxes when that when that happens. But I I think that's a very I don't know of any studies that have been done on that, but I, that's a very interesting question. Um, I tend to think property tax abatements are a little bit desperate myself, but that's my opinion. So, thanks. Uh, 7.5 acres per... Units so, per acre. So 7.5 units per acre mm -hmm. to make the mass transit feasible, like capital-wise or mm -hmm. operation-wise? Well, um, really operation-wise, um, you can you can get the, the capital usually from uh, you know the, the federal government. Um, there there was an interesting case that we had in, in, in the city of Lancaster where the mayor, who was a was a really good guy, um, he said I can get the money to put in a trolley, you know, on tracks from the train station down you know two miles to the center of the city. But we'll lose at least a quarter of a million dollars a year on operating expenses. So, so that killed the project. So, because they really didn't have the density to support it. Yeah. Is affordable housing being looked as? A a way of creating wealth? If it's yes, what will be your recommendation for urban planning planners in areas where people could have land but doesn't have uh, the ability to develop housing and how we can uh, see those to increase uh, the productivity in those regions? Have you thought about that? <laughs> The reason why I'm asking you that is because, for instance, I'm from Honduras. And what's going on uh, right now is that actual government, what he's doing is giving concessions to foreign investors to develop some areas where already have people living there with um, collective titles of land and being evicted. And the way they are planning to develop, creating those, uh, um, they call, um, this guy, Paul Runner, I forgot right now his name. But Startup cities? Yes, exactly. Thank you. And uh, what they're doing is evicting people, and they're planning to have their own um, a judiciary system, everything outside coming to Honduras and having nothing to do with the people. So that's the reason why I'm asking. Okay. Well, uh, I, 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 think that, I think the crux of what you're getting at you know, is, is, is very interesting. You know, can you use affordable housing as a way to build wealth? And I think, I think the answer is yes. And, and I think that the, the, the real issue is how are we going to do that? Who is, are, you know, the way we're doing affordable housing now is, you know, through the, you know, the low, the low income housing tax credits. And my son works with these and they're a pain in the neck. And with the, with the cut in taxes last December, um, you know, that isn't going to be as attractive as it was before. The, the other thing I think we need to think about, and, and 
I'm not being a Marxist when I say this, but we've only built about one million units of public housing in the United States. And the first time we did that, we did it the wrong way because the model was Le Corbusier, you know, the towers in the park, and you ended up with these, you know, projects that just just were horrendous, you know. Um, and there, there's a, a, you know, been a program that that came along in in the '90s, the Hope Six program, which, you know, is public housing, but it's you know much more of a garden apartment model. So it's of a human scale, not you know turning people into ants. And there, there might be a way. And I know England has done this. For example, they they've they've allowed um, you know people to actually buy their public units, you know, over time. And so maybe that's a way because the ownership, you know, once you once you're an owner of the property, then you've really got a stake, you know, and then you're you're gonna, you know, you're you're making a stand. And so I think there has to be a way that we get the housing built in the first place because that's the crying need, but then be able to transition it out of public ownership into private ownership. I think that would, would really be the way to do it. In dealing with Honduras, let me give you the example of New Zealand. You see what New Zealand did about a week ago? They said no foreigners are going to buy any property in New Zealand from now on. You know, this is the way it is also in Prince Edward Island in Canada because you know, they want to keep things affordable for the locals. That law was once existed in Honduras, but after the coup d'etat in 2009, that had changed, and they're selling crazy like crazy the land okay. and the natural resources. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's uh, just after 5.15. We'll just cut it off. Uh, I'm quite sure Tom will take any questions um, after this, but we'd like to thank Tom for an excellent presentation. <laughs> In, in fact, we'd like to thank all our presenters today. So